Welcome to the Somatic Movement Summit, a free online event where you'll learn from leading experts how to embody all of yourself through the medicine of movement. Share this powerful program with your friends and family, and come join us on Facebook at The Shift Network. And now your host, Gayatri Schriefer. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you are joining us here today. I'm so excited to introduce to you today our special guest, Brian Siddhartha Ingle. He's a licensed doctor of osteopathic medicine, a naturopath, and a certified Hana somatic educator. He's also a somatic yoga teacher and a practitioner of the Feldenkrais method. He's an aqua body worker with more than 30 years of experience in the field. Brian is a co-founder of Living Somatics and the founder and program director of the Ingle Institute for Somatic Education. And Brian is the, also the host for this summit. So, Brian, welcome to this session and to the summit, <laughs> to your own summit. <laughs> How are you today? I'm, thank you for that introduction, Gatri. I am feeling very well. It's a pleasure for, for you to be interviewing me because we've known each other for so long and you really know my life path, especially in the somatic time. Yeah. So good. And so please share with us a little bit about how you came to the somatic field. What got you started? Well, I could spend a long time answering that question, but I'm going to try to keep it short because we've got a lot to cover. And the first thing I'd like to say is I was very sporty when I was a kid. Rugby was a big passion of mine. It still is to watch, not to play. Um, but in terms of more um, embodied work, I, um, all my brothers and sisters were going off to study engineering in higher maths in university. And I just you know, had this really not so interesting job at the age of 18 when I finished school. And I, I realized that you spend so much of your time working in life that you better really love what you're doing. So I sat down in my kitchen, my mother's kitchen, in our, in our home, a childhood home. And I asked the question, what is it that you want to do with your life? And out of nowhere it came, I want to heal people with my hands. And I was 18 at that point, And I have spent the last 35, six years, seven years, either studying or working in the field of helping people with my hands or moving my body to help myself. That's how it started. And... Then in terms of the, the embodied movement, so I went to um, study massage, that's how I started. And then I went to Istanbul I, when I was 19, after that massage training, I hitchhiked from Dublin to Istanbul. And on the way, I went to Athens and I got a ferry to a small island and I picked up a book on yoga in Athens and I found this derelict house that was a building site actually that wasn't with no roof on it. And I decided I was going to fast, I was going to meditate, and I was going to do yoga, because that's what that book was about. So without even knowing it, I became a little mini sadhu at 18 years of age, and I inquired into what it's like to move with awareness. And I could go on and on, but that was my early beginnings. <laughs> Wonderful. And I also know that you then continued to India and further down the, the yogic path. Is that right? Well, I have been practicing all sorts of disciplines, um, uh, meditation disciplines, yogic disciplines, working with uh, different masters. Um, I was the osteopath for Punjaji for in the last two years of his life. And yeah, it's been quite a colorful journey. I'm in India right now, and I, I live here in Southeast Indian Pondicherry. But yes. It's been quite an amazing journey and quite an interesting life I've had so far. Yes, indeed. So the, the theme of this summit is, of course, somatic movement. So please share a little bit about your somatic work. Well, I work with two ways, I, three ways I work at the moment. One is I work with people, uh, what I, I used to call patients, and now I call students because I'm trying to teach them something or I'm to try creating conditions for them to learn. So they're on the table and I work with them in a somatic way. 
I have a conversation with them with my hands and I try to create circumstances for them to learn something and for them to change themselves through their own nervous system. I also teach um, awareness to movement lessons, somatic movement lessons, um, so that's a group setting. Um, and that's just suggesting possibilities for um, a student, again, to find something out about how they move and improve their, their function. And usually a side effect of that is that they have less pain. And that's why a lot of people come to me. Um, it's because they have pain, but I, I teach them how to learn and how to improve self-use. And with that, they have less pain. And the third thing I do is I teach trainings in this work. I teach people how to do the hands-on work. I teach them how to teach the movement lessons, and that is my professional life. Great, and so can you speak a little bit about what is the meaning of SOMA? What is somatics really all about? Mm -hmm. Well, SOMA means, well, the Greeks call it body, but actually Tom Hanna sort of took it a little bit further and he called it the living body. So it's mind, body, and spirit as one functional unit. And somatics is our privileged, unique first person experience of how we feel when we move. So there's many different somatic disciplines. And as long as you are working from the inside and following some strategies or some principles, or as Tom Hanna said, you're on the other side of the looking glass, meaning you're working from the inside, then you're in the somatic realm. So that is soma and that is somatics. And then we have, because most people are familiar with movement in terms of exercise and running and weight training and things like that. So how would you say that somatic movement is different to regular exercise? Well, it's, it's the awareness factor that's the most important thing. And it's, it's actually more than that. It's following some strategies. So working from the inside, being aware of how you're using yourself is a very important factor. And also a very important factor is to find pleasure in the movement. So it's not just pushing, pushing, pushing. In fact, a lot of the, a lot of the way that you want to set up yourself for a somatic inquiry in relation to movement is to feel comfortable, to be aware and to find pleasure in your movement. So if those um, factors are there, then you're more working from the inside. And with that, you can learn. And in, in scientific language, we can talk about a shift into the parasympathetic nervous system, which where rest and repair and learning takes place. So if we can think about that while we're doing our movements. Am I in this place of safety? Am I in this place of learning? Am I in this place of rest rather than going for the sympathetic response of just pushing, forcing, going beyond our limits? So if we can find pleasure, if we can find rest, and consciously always come back to that. Is this pleasurable? Am I respecting my limits? Am I comfortable? Am I at rest? Am I learning? Is my mind pretty at ease? All these factors uh, enable us to work uh, in a somatic way. We can somaticize any movement practice if we apply these strategies. Hmm. So true. And in this day and age, especially at this particular time with the COVID going on internationally, it really is affecting everyone. And so what is the importance of having a somatic practice in these particular times? Good question. And um, obviously the answer is it's very, very important. Um, I, I feel I have actually what's going on for me right now is that I feel I've spent my life preparing for this time because I have these practices that is from behind me. I have all these teachers that I'm standing on their shoulders. So when I look back, on this uh, lockdown COVID-19 period, I want to say to myself, wow, that was a growthful time. That was a useful time. That was a pleasurable time. And that was a wonderful time. And to date, every day has been like that. And that's because I'm resting in my practice. And I'm feeling embodied, I'm feeling alive, I'm feeling happy despite the limitations that's being imposed on me from the outside. So very important. Mm. 
Indeed, it is to be able to resource in these particular times of challenge and hardship and to come into these elements that I would say even make us humans, you know, that are um, a bit more of our capacity and that allows us to go beyond fear and anxiety. And of course, there is a lot of hardship going on, but still, it's very uh, inspiring to hear you speak about that, that you're able to access I would say a state of freedom in the midst of, of, of the, what's going on in India right now where you are. And so yes, that's a very important um, point um, that you talked of. And that is a lot of us are driven by fear right now. And very early on in this um, challenging time, I noticed fear coming up and that's just not my pattern at all, at all, at all. And I was like, whoa, what's this? And I decided that I was not going to buy into that fear story. And I would only respond appropriately to the circumstances and to the environment around me. And if I needed to shift to, paras to sympathetic, which is fight or flight, I will do that effectively. And then I will come back to parasympathetic. So consciously, as I'm moving around on my motorbike, as I'm walking the streets and the villages here, I'm very aware of what's happening. I'm very in tune with my environment. I'm seeing the people around me. I'm looking, is this a friendly face? Is this okay? Is this fine what I'm doing? And everything is cool. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm responding appropriately to the environment because I'm sitting back in this parasympathetic nervous system all the time. I consciously go there, not only in my practice, but because I do it so much in my practice, I bring it into my world and into the environment that I'm meeting. And that is, of course, an ex a very, very useful skill to have. And could you say a little bit about how have you develop developed that skill? Because that is something that we're not just, we don't just have that. It often takes practice. So what can someone do and what have you done to develop that skill? Hmm. Oh, well, you know, India was a great learning for me in that regard for many reasons. And, you know, when I started my journey, I think I had an innate capacity to resource um, uh, my bodily intelligence and my intuition. I mean, at the age of 18, to be able to just close my eyes and ask myself that question and that response coming, that's quite um, unusual, I would say. So perhaps maybe I was born lucky in a way that I was always going with my gut and my intuition, and I valued that bodily uh, intelligence more than just the thinking mind, which often makes rational decisions based on society and based on what your parents want or others want. But I'm very, very good at resourcing what is, what is the correct action here? What is the right thing to do? It's not necessarily about what I want, but what's needed in the situation. So uh, there's a word for it we have in India in the yoga tradition, which is dharma or even in, in the, the Krishna and Gita, when they had Krishna and Arjuna, when they had that conversation, you know, the, the main thing, the, the essence of the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita is yoga stat kuru kamani, which means established in yoga, established in being, perform action. Get out of your head, get into the essence, the spirit of who you are, and act from that place of deep wisdom and knowing. Now, you know, Arjuna couldn't even do it, and he had Krishna <laughs> there. <laughs> he had to have some profound teachings uh, to show him that way, and there's many, many possibilities for that. What I would suggest is you find something that really gives you pleasure, something that you can do that is sustainable, and it's not something that's a chore, whether that be meditation, whether that be embodied movement practice, whether that be even dancing but the important thing is is that you are following these strategies that i spoke of earlier mm -hmm. and hearing you speak reminds me of when we used to live in india many many years back and where somatic work was our spir spiritual practice so to me there is a very apparent um, or apparent link between somatic work and spirituality. 
And I see that very clearly in you. And you're also, also speaking about your lifelong spiritual practice and your embodied journey. So what is the connection for you between somatic work and spirituality? Well, I have been practicing yoga since, oh, 13, six, seven years. And I've gone through a lot of different journeys around that. And um, in terms of, let's, let's, let's take it on a somatic level in terms of movement and how that can shift us in terms of our development and our spiritual development. So if we are, you see, yoga today has become very much more like an exercise. Um, students of yoga tend to do it so that they can look good, so they can get a yoga high, so they can produce these hormones inside, and sort of these druggy hormones, okay, they're, it's, 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 they're, it's produced from within, but it's still not exactly where, what Patanjali was talking about when he talked about yoga. So to, find, to, follow, to practice these strategies of doing less, of finding comfort, of finding pleasure, of working from the inside, from the inside, of being aware and um, because in any spiritual tradition, the, the main axiom is know thyself, know thyself. So we have to ask the question, who am I? What is this self? And from a somatic perspective, that includes the living body, the mind and the spirit as one functional unit. So you can affect all three by working with one and a very uh, easy and natural and simple way in to develop is to use our living body. If we can apply these principles of nonviolence, of looking for ease, finding pleasure, because there's a whole world of pleasure that we can find inside. If we just ask that question, how do I feel? How am I moving? How am I relating to the environment? Uh, what sort of practice can I develop? And then bring that into my world. So the answer to the question is, Work with these somatic strategies in any practice that you can, and you'll see that you will become more aware of who you are from the internal perspective. You'll see how you are relating to the environment, and you'll see yourself developing and improving. But I would say that the main answer to that question is intent. If you have the intent to grow, if you have the intent to evolve, if you have the intent not to harm another with your words and with your actions and with your speech and with your thoughts, then that intent will give fruits in time. It's not really what you do. It's the intent behind what you do, which bears fruit. Mm. That is very deep. That is very wise what you are sharing just now. And as we are able to sense ourselves more, more clearly and move in our lives with greater attunement, things open to us and things will unfold more easily more, most often. And at least we have more skill in order to handle life and the variety of ways that life is going to happen for us. So what would you say is when we are doing our practice, uh, what is the benefit, generally speaking? You have already covered it, but if you would just draw it down to a couple points, what is the benefit of a somatic practice if we're taking outside just a spiritual or the spiritual context into life itself? Um, I would say happiness. I would say was one word that I would use happy for no reason, but actually there is a good reason because you're feeling yourself. So joy, happiness, regardless of circumstances. Um, I, I, I think that the, the most benefit that I receive from my work is just um, pain-free body that can do what I want to do and move how I want to move and achieve what I want to achieve in life because I don't have any limitations on a physical level. Gotcha. So if I was, if I was sick, if I, if I was injured, then you can't really um, move forward in life uh, to achieve the worldly goals and desires. 
So I, I say health, health and happiness and freedom. Mm. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. And it's what has been always very, very striking for me about with you is that you always go for complete freedom. So you always, you, uh, you love freedom, which is of course excellent. And in your expression as a man, you are very free. I mean, you are driving around your motorbike, you are working all over the world, you love to be active, you like to run and move. And so, and you're doing uh, sea kayaking and the surfing and all these things. So the way I saw you is always that you are physical manifestation of this eagerness for life and just being alive was an, a, ref, a reflection of who you are but also that maybe you you have come to this work because it is a good fit for who you are is the work would you say is it really that the work is inherently about freedom and is that did, did you come to the work because it is about freedom or are you are you is freedom your matrix well hmm when Tom Hanna was a philosopher and he was all about freedom for sure. And I, I think for me, freedom was always part that I couldn't, uh, to put limitations on me, I never liked it at all. So I think that was just inherently part of my makeup. But to be honest with you, the way I came into the somatic work was a very simple thing that I did it was one of my Astanga yoga teachers gave me Tom Hanna's book, Somatics. And the first movement in that was simply just lying on the back with your knees bent and very gently turning the pelvis and arching the back and flattening the back. And in the book, it said, do it very slowly and just respect your limits and be aware of what you're doing. I thought, okay, I'll just do this. I'm going to do this exactly how it's being prescribed. Just this one movement. I did it for like three minutes, just incredibly slowly and really aware and finding comfort and ease with interest and seeing how that ripples through to other parts of my body, you know, getting those connections to the whole. So I'd give this a good try just for three minutes of my life. And I got up and I went on my motorbike and my posture completely changed. Now, I had in osteopathic, when I was in osteopathic school, a little bit of a, a hyper arch in my lower back, which is called a hyperlordosis. And, you know, they were trying all these different things to sort of fix this hyperlordosis. And I did this thing for three minutes and my back became flat and my posture completely changed. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What is that all about? And for the last 25 years, I have been investigating what that is all about. And what that is all about is how we improve the function of our nervous system to change our structure because structure follows function. If we improve how we use ourselves, our structure will change and our posture will change and our self image will change and our thinking will change and our life will change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is how it goes. That is the beauty of somatic work that we can really take it home and we have an ability to affect the entirety of our life. So I know that you are very, I would, I always call you that you are a somatic genius because the way you are so embodied and you're really living what somatics is all about, freedom and self-connection. Uh, you're, you're a very intuitive person, but you're also very creative. So I've seen you countless times put your, your fascination of that particular month or year into good action by developing work whether it be clinical hands-on work and the somatic education work or aqua body work or equine work, whatever it is, you have, you have a, a way of translating your inspiration and your insights into something that is applicable to others where others can gain that same learning. So can you speak a little bit about perhaps the somatic yoga work that you do? Oh. Or other work, even also the aqua, the aqua body work. I know just, I just would like to hear a little more about your reflections around what has inspired you to develop the somatic field. I'll talk briefly about yoga and then I'll go on to the aqua body work because I spoke a lot about yoga already, I think. Um, 
you know, yoga, as I said, has become this exercise thing and not a, not really a yogic thing, which is to do with self inquiry and growth and development. And the whole asana thing has just been far away from the essential teachings of what yoga is meant to be all about, which is finding ease and comfort. So I just applied these strategies. How do I find pleasure in, in my body as I move? How do I use myself and actually come out of the whole way of idea of stretching as well and actively engage my higher centers to inquire into an asana rather than trying to just stretch a muscle. So m many of these principles made me just applying these principles into the yoga practices was deeply rewarding for me and still is today. I mean, today I had a beautiful practice um, and it's still going on and it's still uh, learning is going on all the time. Now, in terms of the aqua body work, I've studied many different um, styles and I've been at it a long time. Uh, studied in Harbin Hot Springs and here in uh, Quiet in Oregon. And the, the missing piece for me around the aqua body work was that they weren't really thinking of how the uh, receiver was receiving <laughs> the work, <laughs> even though they were a receiver. So I started, asking, I started bringing in these somatic principles and I was like, well, what is my student, my receiver, the person I'm holding in my arms in the water or under the, on the water or under the water, what are they learning about themselves? How are they taking this in? What's going on for them? Am I respecting their limits? Am I going slow, and slow enough so they can really feel what's going on? So I started really applying the somatic strategies with the aqua body work. And so aqua body work is very, very fine, fine work. And then when I started doing this, something else started to kick in. And that was, I could feel without words, what that person in my arms and hands was lacking in their lives in a very profound level. It could be something like a father figure or a lover or a mother or, because often um, I'd come out of the session, uh, we'd finish the session, I would ask my student or my receiver, how was that feeling? Like, oh, it felt like father, mother, lover, so much love, so much everything. But I found that I, I could, could become a conjugate for my student, for my client, and give, I could read what they were lacking, provide that space for them in the context of water, which was doing most of the work anyway, warm water, giving them support so forth. And this transformation would happen for them on a very deep level because I could listen to what was going on and they would confirm it every time after the session. So bringing the somatic way into the work was it just a beautiful thing for me. In terms of hands-on stuff, that work, because I'm a water guy, I was born in Ireland, I Surrounded by water, I grew up by the sea, I, I used to do whitewater kayaking when I was a kid. I swim every day and I do wave skiing as well um, in the last like six or seven years. So I'm a water boy and to bring my therapy into the water, to bring my somatic understanding into the water for me was a fantastic journey. And it goes on, but um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> It does. And you're also speaking here about the importance of tuning in, which I would say is so inherent in, in the somatic work is this ability to listen, to quiet ourselves so that we can not just perceive ourselves, but also with, with clarity, perceive our surrounding other people, nature and so on. And I have seen you work with clients many times. And what's always very striking is that you hold such a profound space for your client or for your student. Can you speak a little more about facilitating that healing space or that learning space? Again, I feel that this is sort of a natural thing that comes to me. My um, hands-on work, whether it be in the water, whether it be on the table, or even in a, in a group setting, but more with one-on-one. -on -one. For me, it is, my, it is like a, a spiritual practice. I would say that I get um, just as much benefit out of it than the person I'm working with because I go very quiet inside. And it's a deep listening. There's a deep um, empathy. There's a deep uh, sense of unconditional regard and respect for the um, person that I'm working with. So I feel refreshed and very happy. 
In fact, it's one thing that I'm missing right now in um, these you know, social distancing, distancing and social isolation times where it's the longest time in my whole professional career of 30, I don't know how many years, six years, that I haven't worked with people with my hands. And um, I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that because it's such a big part of my, my life and my practice. And mm. I'm wondering how that's going to... I'm hoping that we can come back to that sooner rather than later. Yeah. So yes, um, it's a, it can be a transformational thing for the practitioner, uh, for the teacher, as well as the student and the client. Mm. And facilitating this learning space, this learning environment, uh, is very, very somatic. And I would say also that it has to do with um, being of service. That when we, um, when we acknowledge that it's not really us doing those changes to a client, but they are make, it is a learning process. That means also that we have opened the gateway to something, that we're there as an educator. And, and is it for you connected to service, uh, your work? Well, you know, the, if, if you're in the idea that I'm doing something and I'm the healer and I'm fixing this person, you're way out of uh, the somatic realm, you know, just far, far away. If you're coming in with, I'm creating conditions for my student to find something about themselves and they are making the changes for themselves and I'm just pr providing opportunities in all sorts of ways to do that, then you're in the somatic realm. So... That is service and your ego goes right out the window and it's all about, it's about the person you're working with. It's about their experience, what they're learning and how you're creating conditions for that. So the more that you can be embodied in yourself, the more that you can be quiet in your system and the more that your student can trust you as a teacher, as a practitioner, because that'll make a big shift for them they have to feel that this guy is, knows what he's doing. He has my back. He's not imposing on me at all. He's listening to me deeply. And I get that a lot with new um, clients and students that come through. I just start to put my hands in a certain way and they just go, wow, this is different. And sometimes they move to tears because they really feel that I'm very sensitive to their system and I don't want to impose anything, but I just want to work with them rather than on them. So yes, it is a very privileged thing for me to work with somebody, to, for them to give me permission to work with them and, for, their, and to, for them to trust me and for me to serve them in the way that I feel that I need to serve them. And that brings me to um, thinking about the work that you're doing with special needs children because that is an environment where it's not a communication through words or... Um, learning in that particular way of processing information um, mentally and so on, but it's really that deep listening. And um, so can you talk a little bit about the, the water work you are doing, um, uh, the volunteer work you're doing with special needs children? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I love children. I've got 19 nieces and nephews. I haven't got any children of my own, but I love, I, I always make a, a deal with my nieces and nephews that, you know, because I play with them a lot. I said, look, no matter what age you are, you're going to always play with me, right? Is that a deal? And they all completely agree to that deal. And say, absolutely, absolutely. And then they get, they get to like 13, 12, 13. And I, was, I said, like, remember we had that deal, but they never hold on to it. So I have to wait for the next one to get a little older so I can play with them and then I lose them. And then they come back when they're like 19 or something. <laughs> they don't play, but somehow they relate to me and they remember those times we had together. So I'm, I'm very much into play. I'm very much into children and the way they're embodied, the way they're authentic and the way they're natural. I mean, it's just like they are the somatic geniuses actually. And we just got to return back to that way that we once were, we got educated out of that because we had to, you know, pay insurance and pay our mortgage and all that nonsense, which is important, but it just takes away from the joy of living and being alive. So I love children. I love working with them. And um, yes, I do work with special needs children in, in the water. And uh, it is very playful and it's very loving. 
and it's all about them learning and they're making change with themselves. It's the same strategies that apply. It's just I have uh, a particular love for children and for the water work. So the two of them coming together in, is a very special for me. Mm. Yeah, I can really tell. And so we have spoken about many different topics now. The somatic skill you have developed throughout your life the different modalities you have mastered. And now you are hosting this summit of somatic movement that will reach so many people and to hopefully inspire and to offer gifts and tools to become more somatically self-connected. And if we just go back to where we sort of started this conversation, where we are in the world today and what is it that you see that somatic work can contribute to the world today, especially in the current state? Well, I mean, I, I've spoken about how it can help during current times. Um, what I would like to see is that there could be a potential transformation for humankind. It's like we are forced to let go of our old patterns and mm. to be the, well, in my world, anyway, to be the best person that we can be and old habits that weren't serving us. Now it's just like, no, we can't do that anymore. We've got to really show up and improve in all levels. Again, the way we talk, the way we speak, our intent, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hoping that uh, during this time that everybody's reflected a little bit more, inquired a little bit more what's important to them, how they are in relation to their beloveds, their family and their friends, even if they're not you know, with them in the same space, but obviously everybody's talking to each other over Zoom and WhatsApp, etc. So I would like, I would like, very much like that people, the world comes out of this with new values, new values, with a sense of, you know, how can I contribute? Uh, how can I offer something? And, and, and to reflect back every time, was that useful? Was that necessary? was that kind in all our actions and our words. And yeah, more importantly, I would say the reflection and the intent to have that and to work with that rather than the action, because actually actions just seem to happen. But if we can work on our intent behind the action, then I think true transformation could take place. So I would say that um, awareness of what we're doing and intent to uh, approach things with, um, non-violence to not harm another to or whether any living being that would be my wish for the world oh that is perfectly put brian so when i'm tuning into what you are sharing is that aspiring to a higher way of being or being the kind of people that we can be being the kind of human person that we can be the best version of ourselves and that in the midst of hardship and challenge how we can access that and instead of going down actually using it to fuel us to go up and and grow and of course the somatic practice is very helpful with that and so i wonder would it be possible that you could share one of your somatic practices with us at this point? So there is one thing, a physiological thing called heart rate variability, which means when we breathe in, the heart rate goes up and when we breathe out, the heart rate goes down. But that only happens when we're accessing our diaphragm, when our belly is soft, when we're allowing the diaphragm to descend. So if we can shift to heart rate uh, variability, it is a sign of health in the system. And most children do have this naturally going on and most adults do not have it going on because I've worked in biofeedback labs in the United States and Sonoma State University where I was interning in biofeedback and all the students there, none of them had this thing going on and we had to teach them how to do it. But there is a way that you can learn how to do it without, um, you know, the biofeedback equipment. So let's just start by maybe putting our hands on our lower abdomen and just sensing our hands touching our abdomen. And let the belly be soft. Just let it, like you can imagine that you're like 
tiger and your just belly is soft and you don't have to hold it in. Just invite that softening to happen. And as you breathe, just allow the belly to soften and see if you can just uh, let yourself be breathed and not that you have to do anything different, but just observe yourself and the breath. And at the same time, as you're breathing in, the belly expands a little. And when you breathe out, something else happens with the belly. So when you breathe in, the diaphragm goes towards your, your pelvis and the organs are pushed forward, which means that the diaphragm is descending and you're breathing from your diaphragm. Okay, so now we've established that. What we can do is we can just take our pulse. If you can find that on your wrist, just take your fingers on your, your pulse and just see if you can establish your heartbeat or your pulse through your wrist. And then, again, come back to just observing the pulse. and just invite the breathing to happen again naturally. Just notice the belly soften and expanding as you breathe in, and then maybe coming back a little as you breathe out. And at the same time, can you pay attention to the breathing as you breathe in and the pulse and is something happening here? Is the heart rate, is the pulse rate decreasing on the exhale? And is it increasing on the inhale? And then as you breathe in next time, just gently arch the lower back and push the belly out a little. And as you breathe out, just round a little bit, just very so slightly as if the head was looking down a little bit and you're rounding your back. So you have the breath, you have this gentle movement and you're aware of the pulse. And then just stop all of that and just take your hands down with the palms facing upwards. And maybe with the palms on top of each other with the left, left palm is facing towards the ceiling and the right palm is also underneath that. And then place that in your, in your lap. And just be with the experience of breathing through the whole system. And imagine you're looking at the nostrils where the air is coming in. Thank you. 
just being present with what is happening with your breath and with the whole of you. When you're ready, just slowly open your eyes and come back. And it's a very simple practice. You can do that at your leisure, at home, whenever you feel. Or maybe just make it a daily thing in the morning and evening. Thank you so much for that practice, Brian. It is so amazing to be able to feel that heart rate variability. It's really a good reminder. And also a good reminder and way to access our belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing. So as we're now coming towards the end of the session, are there any closing words that you would like to share with the listeners? Be considerate of how you impact your environment and the people around you and come back to the intent of to do no harm. Thank you for that. And for pe people to find you, could you state how they can do that? They can come to our website, which is your website too, Gayatri. <laughs> it's uh, livingsomatics.com, livingsomatics.com. Wonderful. So... Thank you for a wonderful session. I so much enjoyed to interview you and to listen to you and to hear you share your, your understanding and experience. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Gatri, for um, leading me with your questions. Um, I felt very comfortable with your, your words and uh, I felt that it was very beautiful to share with you in this way. Thank you again. It was, thank you. And also thank you for everyone who has, has been listening today to this great session with Brian Siddhartha Ingle. Thank you for joining the Somatic Movement Summit, brought to you by the Shift Network. To learn more, visit somaticmovementsummit.com. To learn more about our global programs, to support you in waking up in all the areas of your life and taking inspired action, visit theshiftnetwork.com. Thank you again for joining us and for sharing this embodied path to vitality and wholeness with your friends and family.